Well, welcome everyone to the inaugural meeting of the initiative for the study of a stable peace. I appreciate all of you uh, taking the time to be here. And uh, based on the on the turnout, I uh, chose well with our first speaker, which is uh, someone known to all of you, uh, my colleague Pete Betke, uh, who is a professor of economics at George Mason and the director of the F.A. Hayek program. And I asked Pete to speak with us today about Kenneth Boulding, Mainline Economics and the Science of Peace. Uh, Pete had a chance to uh, interact and learn from Kenneth Boulding during his time as a graduate student at George Mason University. And of course, Pete is the main intellectual driver uh, behind the uh, mainline tradition of economics. And so since both of these topics and themes are central to what I'm trying to do uh, with ISSP, I figured he'd be a uh, uh, obvious choice to kick us off. And so I've asked Pete to uh, talk to us and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and conversation. Uh, and we'll uh, just use the raise hand function and I'll, I'll kind of call on people and, and we can have a conversation. So with that, let me turn it over to Pete. Pete, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm on. Right. Thank you very much, Chris. This is a, a great initiative, and the turnout here is amazing uh, to reflect on uh, all the hard work that you've done uh, in your career to uh, excite the minds of young people to want to, you know, pursue this very important aspect of studying uh, sort of what are the preconditions, what are the possibilities for a stable peace. So Chris asked me to talk about bolding mainline economics and peace studies. And what I decided to do was try to break that down into uh, bolding as a, um, uh, as a teacher, bolding as a scholar, uh, bolding as a, um, a role model um, for all of you. So uh, the first thing I'm gonna say is that uh, Kenneth Bolding was a very, a very unique uh, professor. He was engaging, encouraging, and enchanted. Uh, what do I mean by that last word? He was very magical. Um, this was different than Buchanan. Uh, Buchanan was very earnest, and it was all about hard working. He, the first message he ever told you was that success in academics is the consistent application of the seat of your pants to the seat of your chair. And then, um, and then if you work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day, you would outwork your lazy colleagues. It's just a matter of outworking your lazy colleagues. Now, obviously, Buchanan had an engine, but that, that's the message that he taught us. Tulloch and Bolding appeared as if somehow ideas came from magic, just like somehow they just like hit them like a lightning bolt. Uh, Tulloch was neither engaging nor encouraging. He was, in fact, a, uh, a targeted missile uh, uh, in the way he did it. But Bolding was engaging and encouraging and enchanted. So he was just very, very drawn to him. I was very fortunate that I had him. Uh, I'll bring this back again. He was a, a, a he's not on the Robinson uh, professor website. I double checked that. Um, which I find very, very weird because he's by far the most prestigious Robinson professor we've ever had at Mason. But he didn't become a Robinson professor. He was always a distinguished visiting Robin, Robinson professor. But if you compare the quality of mind that Bolding had and the accomplishments and everything like that to compared to all the other Robinson professors, which are supposed to be the most distinguished professors at George Mason University, it's like, um, you know, I don't know what the right analogy is, but it's like absurd. Like one is here and the other ones are all down here. Um, and so it's it's pretty phenomenal that they don't like make a big deal out of the fact that they had Kenneth Bolding. And not only that, he did it twice. So he did it in 1985 and 86, but then he get, did it in 1988 and 89. During the 85, 86 year, uh, my friend Dave Perchicko and I became very, very close to Bolding. We, we, uh, went to lunch with him all the time. He invited us over to his uh, house where he gave us milk and cookies and talked to us about, uh, you know, ideas and stuff all the time. And uh, and as a result of that, Dave uh, received Bolding support for his Fulbright Fellowship. 
And, uh, uh, and I, of course, you know, also got a lot of support from him such that there was a track record in his papers so that when he passed away, um, when they were asking people to do obituaries for Balding, both Pacheco and I were asked as, quote unquote, some of his last students. Um, so we were we were close to him and we exchanged in interactions with him. Uh, Bowling, just as a quick bi biographical sketch, you know, was born in 1910, died in 1993. He's a graduate of, quote unquote, New College Oxford, which if you know anything about Oxford is actually Old College Oxford, um, in 1932 with first honors. Um, he then, uh, he, he by the way, he published uh, a paper in the EJ while he was an undergraduate, at, and Keynes was the editor of the EJ at the time. Uh, and then he was a Commonwealth Fellow at the University of Chicago from 32 to 34. As he used to jokingly say, the Commonwealth Fellowship paid him a lot. It was in the middle of the Great Depression. So he was like a wealthy graduate student. So the problem with the Commonwealth Fellowship, he said, was why would anyone not continue to be a graduate student? Because they were actually better paid than, than other people on that fellowship. Um, he does have an advanced degree. This sometimes isn't remembered. He does have a, a, um, a an MA degree from Oxford that he achieved in 1939. Um, uh, again, just to give you an example, Ronald Coase doesn't have a PhD either. He has an MSc. It was very common for people at that time not to get PhDs. They had master's degrees, and those were enough of an advanced degree uh, to go uh, forward in, in your career. Um, while Bolding was a Commonwealth Fellow, he uh, was championed by Frank Knight, who was at the time probably the uh, the leading economic thinker in the United States. Uh, Bolding is able to go to Edinburgh, teach there from 34 to 37, then Colgate, 37 to 41, then Iowa State, uh, where he makes a, a, um, uh, advances to full professor. Uh, from 43 to 49, and he takes a year off from there in 46, 47, where he has a, a chaired professorship at McGill University. And in 49, he moves to Michigan, and he's there from 1949 to 1966, and then from 1967 to 1980. Um, as you might know, Balding was the second John Bates Clark medal winner in um, uh, right after uh, uh, Paul Samuelson and before Milton Friedman. So the first winner is Samuelson, second winner is Baldane, third winner is, is Milton Friedman. And uh, he achieves that uh, award in 1949 is when he's given that, which is it's credited with him being at University of Michigan uh, when, he, when he gets that. Um, and uh, then he's president of the American Economic Association in 1968. His presidential address is very important for this initiative because its title is Economics as a Moral Science. And Balding didn't believe that economics could be strictly a value-free science. So in this sense, he's very much in the tradition of Adam Smith. Doesn't mean that he denies that economic analytics can't be valuable. In fact, we're gonna argue that it's extremely valuable to him. Um, but that economics uh, is is this part of a broader idea of the of the moral sciences. So my next comment is is about Bolding as a scholar, and that we'll go into that a little bit in more detail. But let me give you a little bit of background first on that, which is that um, I went I I learned economics in a weird way. I went to Grove City College. Um, Calculus and statistics were not part of the economics requirements there. They were part of the business school requirements or general ed requirements. So I had courses in calculus as well as I had courses in uh, statistics, but they were not connected to economics. Economics at Grove City did require us to study logic. So we had to study formal logic, symbolic logic, and all of that. That was a requirement for it. So rather than the calculus requirement, we had to do logic, <laughs> all right? So that's one weird thing. 
The second thing is, is that the way in which economics was taught there is that at least at that time, I don't think it's true anymore, is that your second year, so you took principles of micro, principles of macro, and your entire second year sequence of economics wasn't intermediate micro, intermediate macro. It was the history of economic thought from Aristotle to the 20th century. Now, it wasn't original works. It was summaries, secondary works, but some of those things were original works. For example, reading uh, Joseph Spangler's work or reading um, uh, Joseph Schumpeter's, you know, work. Those were our textbooks. Okay, so uh, you know, there it, it wasn't like we were getting, you know, the 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 uh, the Hallburner version of history of economic thought, you know, in the in the worldly philosophers. So we had to read those things, and it was a year long, year long. Then in your junior year, you took intermediate micro, intermediate macro. So it was after you did all of that that then you, you know, did the other stuff. So in my junior year, um, I had uh, sort of captured the attention of the main economics professor there, a guy named Hans Senholtz. And Senholtz had a program that was run through the international college. So he could grant masters and PhDs to students in a tutorial fashion. And in the uh, January of my junior year, when I came back to school, uh, Senholtz invited me to become a, the only undergraduate participant in the graduate seminar. And so from the second semester of my junior year all the way through my senior year, I was a participant in the seminar. And the seminar consisted of two things, original papers that the participants had to present, or great books. So you would go months talking about like this book or that book or whatever. A lot of it was Bombavric because that's what Senholtz was the translator of Bombavric. Um, but um, also we had to read Marx, we had to read Keynes. This is like in the original, this is part of the seminar. But then at the end, each participant would have to, you know, present a seminar paper. I wasn't asked to do that until the, the second semester of my senior year. So I had to do it before I graduated, but he didn't ask me to do it when I was a junior or, or first semester. So that was great books. Okay. So year long history of economic thought. The way you learn economics is by studying the history of the conversation in economics. That's what we were taught. Economic theory in Senholtz's imagination is the same as political theory in a political science department. The way you learn theory is not formal models. That's just a, a slice of contemporary theorizing. The way you learn uh, theory is by studying how it is that the history of economic conversation evolved. Second thing is, is that when you really get serious about it, you read the original works, you read the great books. And of course, that means Adam Smith. You know, So you have to read Adam Smith and you got to take him seriously. And that's the start. It goes from Adam Smith all the way up you know, to, to Mises. All right. Um, I show up at GMU. There's a history of thought class. It's a, there's a history of thought requirement, but there's a history of thought class. I know enough now that I realize history of thought is how you learn how to do theory. So I signed up to do over, um, you know, uh, overload classes for a lot of my graduate education. I ended up by doing this as a habit. Um, I will tell you this, the graduate director was not um, in, in, in engaging, encouraging, or enchanted. He hated Austrian economics. He hated the fact that we had the Center for Study and Market Processes in the department. I didn't know that at the time. I sat in front of him all enthusiastic, thinking everyone loved everyone at George Mason. And he kept on telling me, yeah, take an overload. Take five courses if you want, six maybe. You know, if you're an undergraduate and you don't know anything, when you show up at graduate school, you have no idea what the quality, the quantity of work that's required. So, you know, during the normal semester, if you took 18 hours, you're taking six classes, like, I've done that. I can do that. What the hell's the problem? Right? So I'm signing up for four, or, you know, whatever classes, you know, right from the beginning. And he keeps on encouraging me. Why? He wanted me to get two C's. As soon as you get two C's, you're kicked out of the program. 
okay? And he wanted to do that. There were several professors at Mason at the time that were like that. They, they were little sneaky bastards and they wanted to undermine everything about your education. And you had to fight them tooth and nail. Um, I, it's a true story. I got to be in a class in graduate school when the professor told me to my face that my paper and my final were the best in the class, but he didn't believe Austrians had a place in the profession. And so he couldn't give anyone an A that advocated for Austrian economics. I said, thank you very much. Um, and we moved on. So this, this, this is a, a, a weird thing. So now, what about bowling? Have you ever read Murray Rothbard? So I read Murray Rothbard like as if he was, you know, my Bible uh, when I was an undergraduate and when I first started graduate school. And Rothbard had this idea of what he called contra Whig history of economic thought. It was how he explained all the different aspects of why it is that really, really great thinkers get derailed in the evolution of economic thought. Well, you know where he got that idea from? Kenneth Boulding. That is Boulding's most important sort of history of economic thought idea when he did after Samuelson, who needs Smith? And his argument is, we all do, okay? And, and so Rothbart leveraged that idea. I had Karen Vaughan for history of economic thought. The first, first day of readings were George Stigler on why it is that we don't need to study history of economic thought and Kenneth Boulding on why we need to study history of economic thought as if it's the most important thing possible. So Boulding as a scholar had laid out this path of what he called contra Whig stories. So don't turn off your cameras. This is gonna be a real, uh, a weird detour as well, which is that when I was an undergraduate, we had this course called on Western civilization, okay? And the professor decided the core, core reading of the class was this science fiction book called Canical for Leibowitz, all right? And it's a story in which there's a nuclear annihilation and then you have to recreate thought after the nuclear annihilation. It's a novel, it's not any like that, but it's supposed to talk to you about different times of understanding knowledge creation. And the idea was, is the enlightenment taught that knowledge creation was a linear path from darkness to light. The Greeks taught that knowledge is circular, okay? What Canical of Leibowitz makes you think about is that knowledge progresses like a corkscrew. We make steps forward, then we go backwards in periods of great forget, then we go forward, then we have great forgets, we go forward and we have great forgets. You right now are living through an era of great forget. That's what's going on right now. Otherwise, no one would be saying things about socialism, antitrust, all these kind of things like that. They would have learned, right? You know, it's and by the way, it's not like they're new arguments about antitrust. They in fact call themselves the new Brandeisians. Why? Because their arguments are the same as Louis Brandeis, which was eh, eh, wrong way back when Louis Brandeis said it. And they're wrong today. So Leah Kahn is wrong. And she's wrong if you took her in a time machine, like Bill and Ted's Excellent Time Machine, and you transported her back to 1935. And she'll be wrong if you transport her to 2085. She's just wrong. She doesn't understand what the hell she's talking about. Because what happened? She forgot the great learning that we, in fact, engaged in. In fact, the Chicagoans called it the new learning, right? But it really wasn't the new learning. It was actually Adam Smith. As a, you know, as, as Ronald Coase puts it in his famous FCC paper, right? He says, my novel theory, novel that is if you haven't read Adam Smith. Okay, so, all right. So we had this great forget. Again, Boulding was on to this. Boulding understood this idea. And so it's this contra Whig idea. And in, in doing that, Boulding places his contribution in this contra Whig tradition. And so how Boulding becomes famous as an economist is he writes a paper criticizing Frank Knight. But from what perspective? The earlier Austrian perspective. So Boulding presents his paper about capital theory and Knight decides to write a criticism of it called Mr. Boulding and the Austrians. All right. And so rather than the idea of the progress that is linear, 
Okay, what Bolding's doing is recapturing the older arguments in the Austrians and then showing that the Knightian thing was a detour. Right, it's a, it's a detour. And that's also true when Bolding thinks about complex coordination. It's also subjectivism. If you read the image, it's a, a, a fantastic book about that. I'm gonna talk about that later. Uh, but also his stuff on price system and, and microeconomics. His textbook, when it came out, put microeconomics before macroeconomics. Keynesian economics had broken that. Samuelson's textbook had made it a dogma that you had to have the macroeconomy in balance before you could have the laws of supply and demand. So Samuelson's principles book, okay, has supply and demand on around page 600. What's on page one? National income accounting. You had to balance the national income accounts before you could talk about supply and demand. Balding is back in the old way of doing it. You start from the choices of individuals, you build out from the individual decision to the firm decision, to the industry decision, up to the economy and economic growth. Balding's recapturing something old, even though he's influenced by Keynes. All right, I'm not gonna deny that. I'm gonna come back to that in a second because what really Balding is, is he's weird conflation of Austrians, Knightian, and Keynesians. So he makes it, he's a completely unique thinker in a lot of ways, because you never know where the hell he's gonna actually be in certain, in, in certain manifestations of this stuff. And so you have an ability to read what you like in him. So like when I wrote about his obituary, it was like, Mr. Bolden and the Austrians, you know, he's like, way to go, you know, Ken, you know, keep it up. Whereas, you know, other people can talk about other things. So he, he uh, by the way, just a little flippant joke about this. In the 1940s, uh, a liberal group decided that they wanted to hire Bolding to go to every town that Hayek had just given a talk on the road to serfdom because they thought Bolding could disabuse the town or the, the university of the ideas that Hayek was giving. He got fired after the third town because he was just reinforcing what Hayek was saying. And so he always chuckled about that. He goes, they fired me or whatever. Um, the last thing is, and this is a very important thing, which is Bolton wrote a book called The Reconstruction of Economic, uh, Reconstruction of Economic Theory. And in it, what he argues is that the basis by which we should study economics is the balance sheet, the accounting balance sheet. So rather than a Valrasian model, we need to go to, I, I, this group, this this should be, especially Karras will leap at this thing, because this is precisely the way that Mises sets up the beginning of human action. We go from individual choice, but then he introduces monetary calculation, right? Monetary calculation isn't something that he introduces in a particular set. It runs all the way throughout the book, Human Action, all right? Because it's the central element that allows capitalism to operate and other systems to you know fall apart. And so if you think about things, even like the, the business cycle theory, it's an economic calculation story. And how do you correct after the, the distortions? You have to recalculate, all right? Mises put that stuff forward. That's what Bolding thought you needed to do in economics, all right? So yes, he's a Keynesian, but what's the answer to the Keynesianism is actually a recalculation of, of, of these things. Now, Bolding on the main line, that is a term he uses. And uh, I'm going to plead guilty to some creative license in the way that I use the term main line and bolding. Because what bolding means by it is just that you can draw a line from Adam Smith to today. And it's, it's you know, it's basically, uh, he doesn't give much content to the idea. Buchanan, in What Should Economists Do?, begins with a quote from Lord Acton. Lord Acton is asked by a, a, a woman, well, a lady, something or other. Um, he is asked uh, which politician she, you know, she should be for. So think about like today, which of the Tweedledee or Tweedledum, which one should I pick, right? Orange man or like Tales from the Crypt. You know, which one am I going to pick in this in this in this idea? And you write to me and ask me, you know, do I pick Tales from the Crypt? I pick Orange Man or whatever. What what Lord Acton responded was he says that basically the politicians 
are just fleeting. They're not important. What matters is those individuals who sit in the seat of Adam Smith. Those are the ones of worthy of our attention and, and, and whatnot. Buchanan begins with that head quote. And he then gives content to what it is that economists should do, right? They should be the exchange paradigm, not the allocation paradigm. Economics is all about uh, exchange relationships, the comparative exchange relationships that exist in politics, that exist within economics. And so economics becomes a study of exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. And if you push him, he says, that's in Adam Smith, that's in us today. Okay, so now mainline economics starts to have some meat on its bones. I'm drawing a line from Adam Smith forward. And then the question is, is who gets counted as a mainline? Who doesn't get counted as a mainline? It's not just who is scientifically fashionable. So for example, David Ricardo isn't a mainline economist, right? In, in this rendering, because David Ricardo purge the human element out of economics, right? It's, it's, it's all about the long run costs of production. This is all about non-human factors that determine the outcomes in Ricardo's model, all right? But Bishop Waitley is actually like a mainline economist. You know, Cantillon before Smith is a, is a, is a uh, mainline economist, right? Because they're studying exchange and the institutions within exchange takes place. What, what would be called catalactics, all right? They're studying catalactics. And so the basic thesis is that mainline economics starts with an animating agent, has an institutional filter, and that generates invisible hand processes. So we derive the invisible hand proposition from the rational choice postulate via institutions. And so our focus is always on the institutional framework within which economic life is embedded. Bolding as a scholar is 100% on board with that project. 100% on board with that project. Um, that's why sometimes he's called an institutional economist because people are confused at the time. If you just stress, because institutions were purged. Again, it's hard for all of you to process this. But in mid 20th century economics, the goal, Francis Bator lays this out in a QJE article, the goal is to have an institutionally antiseptic economics. Okay? Oscar Longa, in his famous papers in 1936 37, accuses Mises of being an institutionalist because he argues that private property is essential to get a price system. Just think about that. He's like, ah, oh, Mises. You're an institutionalist. You're not a theorist, right? How did Mises doesn't even understand that? I'm being called a Schmollerite, you know, like it doesn't make sense to him, right? And yet that was the, the claim because that's how screwed up economics was. And so in the post-World War II period, you had to rediscover property rights, law and economics, po political economy, social and cultural mores, those all had to be discussed. Whereas if you go back and read Adam Smith, customs and practices are in the theory of moral sentiments. Property contract and consent is embedded from David Hume through Adam Smith. We didn't do economics as if we didn't have those things at that time. All right. But yet we lost all of that. And so we had to rediscover it in the 20th century. Some people that are very unique in that early sort of period between Hayek and, Bu and, 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 and Buchanan, people fall in a crack. So Buchanan is old enough to be at the beginning of the new institutional revolution and recognized as such. Hayek, who actually in the Abuse of Reason project is the first new institutionalist economist, is not recognized because he's 10 years ahead of everyone else, okay? Bolding falls in that period, just like Milton Friedman, between Hayek and Buchanan. So people fail to appropriate him in the right way. Okay, so they don't see where he's at. So it usually begins with Alchin and the evolution paper, discovering property rights again, all right, and the market process. Then you get, you know, posts and the law and economics revolution. That's 1960. You get Buchanan and the public choice revolution. That's 1962. 
All right. And so you get market process economics. That's Israel Kirzner, 1973. So you see there's a there's a gap there. And what did these people do? Bolding falls in that gap. So it's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, bolding was, in fact, so vital to uh, understanding. You know, like when I was a graduate student, seeing this nighty in the heritage and its own unique mix relating into the market process sort of tradition. OK, uh, so that much said about bolding in the main line. But just so that everyone understands, main line is not a list of economists Pete likes. All right. It's a list of economists that actually derive the invisible hand from the rational choice via institutions. OK, that's the key thing. There's lots of economists who deny the invisible hand or deny the rational choice postulate. They are not mainline economists. There's other economists who collapse the invisible hand to the rational choice postulate. That's the equilibrium always type folks. OK, they collapse it, which means institutions are a pass through. So let me just take like a colleague of mine, Brian Kaplan. Think about his analysis in, uh, you know, uh, the myth, uh, 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 you know, myth of, of a rational voter. Right. OK, what's going on in that? All right. Just notice what he does here. He has preferences, politics, policy. In Kaplan's world, what's going on? The preferences that we have are perfectly reflected in the policies that we choose. Politics is merely a pass-through. It's like a door that you walk through that has no friction effect on you. Preferences, policy. What's Kaplan's criticism? Your preferences. Right? Your preferences are messed up because you suffer from these cognitive biases. Right? Foreigner bias, all these other things like that. But it, it's not at all where you start where the machinations of politics are what distorts your preferences and policy. That's public choice. Public choice is about the distortions. Kaplan's not contributing to public choice. His effort is destroy public choice. Uh, right? That's right. He, he's, he's arguing you don't have concentrated benefits, dispersed costs. You don't have any of that stuff like that. I know we all like him, you know, yay, yay, you know, Brian or whatever. Right. But the reality is, is that politics to him is not an institutional framework through which we study the systematic distortions that lead to concentration benefits and dispersal of costs. We get the government that we want. The problem is the kind of government you want. Not we get a government that none of us ever wanted because we wake up one day and say, you know, WTF, which has happened. I want this. And instead we get that. Al-Shami, this is why I would, I, I'm resistant to your claim, though I agree with it, that everything is about this orchestrated evil that, uh, you know, people have and they sit there like this. So to me, for example, the way to study Stalinism is not to sit there and say, oh, you know, Lenin and Trotsky all got there and rubbed their hands behind the back of everyone and said, how can we screw over humanity and take all kinds of power to ourselves? Instead, it's like, how can I centrally plan and control an economy to bring us from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom and deliver for mankind for the first time this beautiful system? And then I wake up and I have the gulag and millions of people being died, and I have to squash dissent. And so what happens is Stalinism is an unattended, undesirable consequence of pursuing this dream aspiration, which in the machination of the institutions can't work. Okay? And so then you get a logic that comes out of that, right? That's invisible hand style reasoning. And note again, invisible hands are not just benevolent. They can be malevolent. So Stalinism is a malevolent invisible hand story. OK, just like hockey helmets and shelling or something like that. OK. All right. So Bolding, I want to see in that same framework. So I read him through that lens all the time. An animating agent, institutions that need to be paid attention to, gives us a filter. So if you want to ask the question, how do you get a stable piece? You're going to have to look at those institutions that are in, uh, foundational for us to be able to take ordinary individuals throw them into these circumstances, and then the outcome should be one of a stable peace. If we don't have that, we're going to undermine it and destroy it. Okay, so how about bolding and peace studies? 
Um, you know, this is just, you know, obviously many of you know this uh, in depth, especially, you know, the, uh, since you're all students of Chris. But let me just re reiterate a couple of things. One of them is Boulding's reflection, I'm going to say that Boulding's reflection on peace studies is deeply personal, deeply analytical, and deeply imaginative. So deeply personal. He's a Quaker. You, you can't understand Boulding unless you understand that he's a Quaker. Um, this had a huge impact on him. In fact, when he passed away, uh, the Quaker schools in the United States, like Haverford or whatever, shut down for a week. Uh, he was the most you know, famous Quaker in the world actually. Um, and, uh, and, and this is, he had a deeply personal repulsion to war. Okay. And that influenced him from his position in world war two to his position in the Vietnam war, where he and his wife actually sheltered draft dodgers. All right. And, and did things like that to be involved and help them. Okay. So deeply personal. Second, deeply analytical. He is, in many ways, the founding figure of the field of conflict resolution, uh, defense and peace economics. I mean, you could probably say Thomas Schelling, but the reality is, is that Boulding moved to Michigan in 1949, and he started the Center for Conflict Resolution there not that long after that. And, um, and, and, and so this was something that was extremely uh, important for him, but also deeply analytical. You had to take the tools of social science to address these issues. That goes back to my point that I just, you know, recently made about the idea of the invisible hand style reasoning. Um, you have a, a, a ordinary individuals, institutions, peaceful solutions, conflict situations, right? So again, it's always a mat, uh, uh, through the, 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 uh, the filter of the human imagination. And you have to have those institutions impinging on that. The final thing is cultures of peace. And this draws as much on Elsa Boulding as it does on, on, on Kenneth. But I want to say it's deeply imaginative. In, in uh, one of uh, uh, Elsa Boulding's sort of main books, she has these chapters on the importance of the imagination for cultures of peace. And I think that's critical to understanding because you have to be able to imagine a world in which a peaceful solution can solve a social dilemma in order for us to act on a peaceful, peaceable solution. If we, what she calls imaginative technologies, if our imaginative technology does not allow us to envision how it is a peaceful solution would come about, the only way we would think about it is through actual violent means, okay? So again, uh, take a, a less uh, extreme example than war, think about something like the COVID-19, right, pandemic. It hits, people are scared, Government exploits the scariness to centrally control the economy, right? And centrally control our lives. And the people acquiesce. Why? Because they can't imagine how they would deal with this big, hairy externality in any other means other than I need to have a boss. But imagine if we had done a better job from 1989 forward and it demonstrated the robustness of civil society rather than worrying about building coalitions with various politicians to lower taxes by 2%, okay? Um, but if instead we had decided to take the imaginative position, which is imagine a world without government, imagine a world in which civil society is robust and resilient, all right? Then when we would have been hit with a big hairy externality, pockets of people might have said, oh, wait a minute, there's other solutions because we've test fed at these ideas in other crises. And it worked out that way. And so there would have been, I'm not saying that because of public choice that the state wouldn't have tried to exploit the situations. Clearly they would have, but that there would have been some kind of civil society bulwark that might've pushed up against it and constrained it in a certain way. This is what Bolden's talking about. So as you think through 
the issue of an, uh, of an imagining a search for a stable peace. Think about ways in which, as, as Chris has talked about it, right, you have peaceableness and see it from your everyday life and then see how it might scale up, right? It might scale up from our everyday life to a broader sort of set of community and, and, and forward for that. Um, all right, so Balding as a, as a, as a scholar, I think um, his work in mainline economics ends up by shaping the way in which he approaches the study of conflict resolution, okay? And so one of the things about Bolding to always keep in mind is that Bolding was never an economic imperialist, but he never gave up economics. He's always an economist. And I'm going to stress this in this last part. So Bolding has a role model. So here's the one thing that I would say to all of you, besides the in, engaging, encouraging, and enchantment, which is very much a personal experience of a teacher. But the other thing that I think you get out of reading Bolding, which is not required you to be in the room with him, but it just is from his readings, writings that you read it, is that he simultaneously communicated urgency and joy. There is an urgency in his writings because what is at stake is humanity. But there's also a sheer joy in scholarship and figuring things out with Bolden. He's not a tortured genius. He is joyful, right? So and he's never angry, even though he's talking about things that make us angry, right? He's never an angry scholar. He's a joyful scholar. He's embracing the urgency of the moment. He's trying to address that. So Adam Smith in uh, the lectures on, um, you know, uh, uh, what are they? The, the ones on science, on, on uh, astronomy, right? He says that, um, you know, we are confronted by wonder, surprise, and then ultimately appreciation, all right, about the physical world that we see. So, you know, at first we see the wonder, and then what happens is we're surprised, and then we develop an appreciation. I, I think you as economists need to do that with economics, right? So one way to think about that is the mystery of the mundane related to the invisible hand, is that you, you see the wonderment of the common woolen coat on the back of the day laborer. You then are surprised at all the coordination of all these you know, divisions of labor and computational, uh, as, as Smith says, exchanges that exceed all possible com uh, computation. And then you develop an appreciation, right, of how the invisible hand operates. And so we work through this in the natural world, just like we work through it in the, in the, in the social world. And that was always evident in Bolding's writings. There's a sense of urgency and sheer joy communicate in wonder, surprise, and appreciation. Okay. Bolding's second thing, which is going to be harder to communicate, but all you have to do is study the history of the record, is that his willingness to build, not just consume. I've recently been communicating to several of the students that are still in the program but those alumni, you should listen to this as well, which is that universities are particularly dysfunctional. And one way to think about their dysfunction because they don't have a residual claimant is that we create stationary bandits. Now, when I normally should say that, you would say, ah, Mansur Olson, stationary bandit. He has an incentive or she has an incentive to improve things in that system, because that's the way in which you enhance growth. But if you don't have a residual claimant, the stationary bandit is going to act like a roving bandit. So you start out wanting to be the stationary bandit, and you end up by becoming like Jabba the Hutt. And so every time you see a senior faculty member, see Jabba the Hutt. He's sitting there, you know, like, feed me, you know, like that. He's just, you know, and they're just consuming rents. Consume more rents, consume more rents, consume more rents. And one way, maybe the only way, is to throw them into the pit, you know, with the digestible worm for the next, you know, thousand years or whatever. 
But the point is, is that there are people who, despite the incentives, are willing to build. All right. Those are unique and very talented people, but they're pivotal people at pivotal times and they're necessary in order to do this. And Kenneth Bolden was one of them. He is the president of six scholarly associations at my at last account, including the American Economic Association, which he was president of in 1968. OK, but he's also General Systems, International St uh, Society for Peace Studies, all these kind of things like that. Balding worked tirelessly to promote a field that he thought was important and vital to our uh, to our survival. He was a center builder. He built research centers to support research and graduate students to come into the fold and study those things. He was an editor. Here's an interesting factoid. He was the editor of the AEA book on price theory with Stigler. Right, so the AEA wanted to put together these these you know little booklets. He's basically like versions of a, of a advanced version of a sham outline. If you remember back when you were a first year graduate student, you might get the shams outlines or whatever. So they wanted to do these for macro, for micro, all these things like that. Bolding and Stigler were the editors for the price theory one. Okay, and they put together what they considered the canonical articles on price theory and that, that every student should learn or whatever. Bolding did that right in the beginning of his career. He did all kinds of things like that throughout his career. Bolding is multidisciplinary, not interdisciplinary. Why do I say that? It's because interdisciplinary research begs having any kind of methodological criteria to it. It basically falls between cracks. What Bolding practiced was multidisciplinary research which is that he, he was an economist, but he then did things in sociology. He did things in political science. He did things again in, in you know, IR and things like that. And each time he moved into those fields, he adopted the methodological discourse in those fields to try to show his point. He was also not an imperialist. So while he was always an economist, he could put on the eyeglasses of the other disciplines and contribute to them proficiently. So it's a very important lesson for all of you, because if you try to follow the line of being interdisciplinary, which is in vogue, the problem in many ways is you fall between the cracks. So again, compared to Murray Rothbard, Murray Rothbard was interdisciplinary. So when I was a graduate student, the joke that went around was that if you talk to economists and said, what do you think about the contribution of Murray Rothbard? By the way, people knew Murray Rothbard. It's not that they didn't know him. That's a big misnomer, too. Rothbart was known. He was a very well-known thinker, published in the AER, published in the QJE. He was part of the conversation, okay? So what they would say is, he's really not that great of an economist, but I hear he's an amazing philosopher. And then, you know, people would, in philosophy would say, you know, he's not really much of a philosopher, but I hear he's really good historian. And then, you know, the historians would come along, they'd say, well, you know, he takes a lot of, you know, cheap, you know, shortcuts in history and everything like that. So he's not really a good historian, but I hear he's a really good economist, right? And what happens is, is therefore you can't advance the ball right now. Let me be completely honest with you, at least from my point of view, I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you if it wasn't for Murray Rothbard. So I'm not trying to say this to knock him at all. I'm just sort of saying that, that model has to be modified if you're going to make advance and move forward the kind of science of liberty that Rothbard cared about advancing, which a version of which is peacefulness. All right. So you got to remember is the science of liberty is grounded in the notion of anything that's peaceful. So it's the absence of coercion that we want to go to. We want to go to a society that's non-coercive or the way even Buchanan puts it, non-discriminatory and non-domination. This is the old Republican version of the science of liberty. Non-discriminatory politics, non-domination relationships, okay? So when we have domination relationships, we're not in liberty. When we have discriminatory politics, we're not in liberty, right? Now that's not a, you know, uh, you know who's the true Scotsman thing. It's a definitional issue. You know, you cannot have 
coercive liberty. It's just, just an oxymoron. So you have to have, you know, liberty is liberal and liberalism is about liberty. That Just remember that, okay? And everyone else that does all the other stuff, they're just tortured logic. Oh, I need to sacrifice liberty in order to have liberty. Really? That's a cool idea. How do I do that? You know, I'm trying to lose a bunch of weight right now. Oh, I have to gain weight to lose weight. You would say, what the hell are you talking about? You know, stop being stupid, right? And so it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I guess to lose weight, I got to lose weight, right? You know, rather than, oh, yeah, I got to gain some weight to lose weight. That just doesn't work. Okay. So bolding is, um, you know, this, this unbelievably proficient writer. His collected works, paper version, not books, over 3,000 pages. And that was done before he retired. OK, so that is uh, that it has an amazing uh, thing to look at. OK, uh, I'm going to end with this and then we can ask a bunch of questions, which is uh, Bob Tullison, who I was close to when I was in graduate school, not because of intellectual things, but because we hung out a lot together and did things together. Um, he, uh, he once remarked to a group of us, James Buchanan wasn't an economist. He was a university. And what he meant by that was Buchanan contributed to political science, he contributed to philosophy, he contributed to economics, right? So he he was a university on, an, on, an, on, a, on himself. And I think the same could be said for bolding. And so bolding as a role model to you is to not get rid of your disciplinary grounding, but to not let it be a straitjacket either, right? It's a great foundation, analytical foundation for you to then branch out and, 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 and attribute those things as you study uh, what constitutes a stable peace. Because you can't answer that, as McCloskey puts it, with prudence-only models. Prudence-only models are not going to work in doing this. So first of all, I just, again, I want to thank Chris for this opportunity, how lucky I was uh, to have been influenced as a very young uh, uh, scholar. Uh, you know, by both Bolding and Buchanan. Um, they, they, one semester that I had both of them at the same time, we spent at least half the semester dealing with Adam Smith's Deer and Beaver model and doing various iterations on it. It led to a paper that Buchanan published in Key Close called uh, the, uh, Simple Analytics of Natural Liberty. And the way he used to teach was he'd write his papers while he was teaching the class and then give us drafts and we had to comment and things like that. Um, but he was obsessed with the model. And then Bolding started getting obsessed with the model. And I went up to him. I said, Mr. Bolding, I said, you know, Professor Buchanan is doing all this stuff on the Deer and Beaver model. Now you're doing it. And he chuckled. He laughed. And he said, ah, he goes, you're just being exposed to Frank Knight. Both of them were students of Frank Knight. And he says, all Bolding ever talked about, uh, all Knight ever talked about in his class was Adam Smith's Deer Beaver model or world religions. That was it. He would like randomly go on a rant about religion, then back to the Dear Beaver model. And, and he was chuckling the whole time. So I was like, okay. So, but Bolding is this uh, 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 sort of amazing university in and of itself. And so it seems to me that as you read him and as you try to, um, you know, incorporate his spirit into your own initiative, not stopping with him, but beginning with him and going forward. Again, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, the way in which he used the analytics of economics, but the way he also was so institutionally grounded. And finally, how he relied, again, from an economic point of view, on the notion of the imagination, the imagination of human beings to, uh, uh, to conceive of situations in which in the highest form of conflict, they can find their way through to rather than shooting one another, actually shaking hands with one another is actually inspiring. And unless we do that, again, um, you guys are too young and you have too many other existential crises to hit you with. But if you watch the Oppenheimer movie, right? Not the Barbie movie, but the Oppenheimer movie. Um, one of the things that it brings back to force is this idea that we have the capability of nuclear annihilating one another like that. 
And that was the entire world in which bowling operated in. And it was the world that I was educated in. Right? When I was in elementary school, they used to make us duck underneath of our you know, desk as if we were going to be attacked by a nuclear bomb. And so you had to put your hands over your head and hide behind your, as if somehow that would stop the rays. But anyway, that's what they made us do. They told us about it all the time. That was our essential threat. If you read Don Lavoie's book, which was published in 1985, he starts with the whole thing, uh, you know, that's uh, dealing with the idea that we can blow each other up. How do we solve these things? That hasn't gone away. The world's still in conflict. The, still, the world still is just a button away from a crazy person. Um, and Bolden gives us a thought process to imagine a world different than that fate that we're in right now. And I think that that is vital. That imaginative step is vital to this initiative, which I think is just one of the more exciting things that have gone on in our program in, 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 in forever, actually.